So cool, awesome. man. So I my one of my scariest moments of my life was Grand Canyon with my three year old, okay. and we were so when I went to go buy our first farm ever, um, it was right when COVID hit in early 20, 2020. And I'm like, let's just get in the car. Let's go up and look at these farms in Idaho. And on the way, we went through the Grand Canyon. We went through Zion yep. and some other cool places. But my three-year-old's up on probably, I want to say like a nine, maybe nine foot, nine foot tall kind of stair steps, kind of yeah. cliff kind of thing, right? And so you don't, you know, each one's probably two feet, right? Between each level of it. And you don't think that big of a deal. And, and he suddenly he's walking along it and he loses his balance. And the next thing I know, he's coming down it and he hits face first on the side of a wow. rock. Right. And and Oof. thank God, God created them as Gumbies. Right. At yeah. that age, because he literally hits sideways face first and it flips over his own head. Right. And and and, and gets up and starts walking. Oh, and man. he's he's got a bruise. Right. And he's, he's kind yeah. of he has some, water and tears in his eyes but like man i i in, in that moment when he went over like the thoughts that went through my head like am i you know like how quickly am i getting this kid to an emergency room am i going to be raising a kid in a wheelchair like like what what is all the because my, my mind runs so fast too you know like 20 different scenarios in 10 seconds so yeah and there's not much yeah. research you, got kids. Kids. you got kids Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've got I got four of them. They're outside right now, so hopefully they don't beat on the door too hard. Uh, I have eight. If seven, they do, it won't, it won't hurt anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Eight to How old three. are they? Eight, uh, seven, whoa, eight, seven, six, and three. Man, so you got, you're like me. My boys are six and seven, so that, 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 how are they, the, the eight and the seven-year-old? Are they boy, girl, or boy, boy, or? Boy. Start girl, boy, girl, boy. So okay. Are the no. seven and eight year old like best friends for a while and then at each other at the same time? Yeah, it goes, you know, every 30 minutes back and forth of trying to kill each other and loving each other. So the boys are particularly hard on each other. Yeah, my, my mine are mine are absolutely ruthless with each other, right? So my my older one's a giant. So he's a seven year old who's you know. I want to say he's 46 inches, almost 40, 44 inches. So he's like closing wow. in on five foot already. And he's 110 <laughs> pounds. Um, wow. And so my, my six-year-old who lives pretty normal size looks like yeah. three, four years younger than him. And so my six-year-old is just always at max effort when he's fighting yeah. with his older brother and stuff. And the older one, like, like he's like, you know, shoe fly. Right. And, yeah. and, but like they're, 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 they're best friends and, but they're also at it too and stuff. So cool, man. Yep. So mobile homes, man, multifamily to mobile homes, you're making the yep. grand, what I call the grand switch. Um, I made it, I made it 2010 myself away from multifamily. Um, and not that I don't think, you know, there's obviously some, could be some real lucrative things in multifamily. You can make money, but I, I made a switch yeah. to doing some alternative things. So tell me how you made the decision to switch or, Walk me yeah. through, bro. Yeah. So start out just uh, knowing nothing real estate, basically wholesaling houses, contracts, making a little cash there, and then started flipping houses. And then flipping houses led to trying to buy some rental property. Luckily, I, I somehow skipped the the idea of buying a bunch of single family rentals as as you know as rentals, and went straight from flipping houses to buying mobile home parks for the for the cash flow side of it. So I'm, I'm glad I kind of skipped that 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 step. Um, bought mobile home parks, did well with them, then started buying pretty beat up Class C and D apartment complexes, repositioned them. You know, typically we'd sell it like year two or three ish, and did well with those. And then uh, so the transition came 2020 ish, a few things leaning up 19, 20. You know, just couldn't. None of my offers were getting taken at all. Right, prices were ridiculous. I wasn't going to change our underwriting standards. And so we're getting outbid on everything. And I'm, I'm just looking at what people are paying for this, what they're buying the properties off of me. And I'm like, I, I don't know how you're making this work, but, but I'll gladly sell it to you, you know, but uh, couldn't buy anything. And then of course, uh, COVID with 2020 and eviction moratoriums and that whole mess of dealing with the tenant side of what we are, what we already owned was really pretty discouraging. And uh, I bought a motorhome which is sitting outside and 
got in it, started driving. Like, man, this is pretty cool. This is fun. I like it as a customer. Found a couple deals on it, you know, off a whim. Just one of them was on vacation, talking to the lady that owned the park. She's like, yeah, I'll sell it. And uh, ended up buying that one. And, you know, uh, so so 2020 was kind of like a experimental type of year for us with the RV space. And then 2021. But isn't, it, like, isn't it kind of mind though? Like, like we did the same thing, right, in 2020, right? We both, like, jumped on the road, right? Yeah. And then, like, like, I went to farms. You went to RV parks, right? And, I, I mean, I think it's kind of funny, like, like that journey. Like, you, you like, we, like, whatever it was, the world was in chaos, right? right. And so, like, you're not that much different than me. Like, I was like, I'm going to go on the road and find something. I'm going to go on the road and create something you know i'm gonna go on the road and do something right so it's it's, it's i think it's it, it's kind of fascinating yeah that, that part of the journey it, it was absolutely pretty- the best time like you know like we yeah. were on the road and there was no one anywhere now it was hard to you know some difficulties of finding things that were open but if they were open it's like i got the place to myself so yeah i agree it's uh I think that goes back to mindset a little bit. It's like know. being on the road in 2020. Like, like it was, yeah. like I could go to Zion and like, there's nobody around and like, like right. you're in the, you know, one of the most epic places on planet earth. And like, like you're, you're, you're pretty, pretty singular and solo on there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It, I think it goes, you know, like, like you were saying, it's all mindset, you know, every problem, there's an opportunity and every, every situation, there's something there's something good out of it, you know, whether it's just no lines uh, in 2020. But I think if you uh, sit in fear and sit back, that's probably the worst thing you can do in any general situation. Yeah, like like fear doesn't do anything for you, right? And I, I always look at even like, you know, over, you know, 20 years of, of running businesses, there are definitely times where the line gets close, right? The financial line, there's a time in uh, 20. 14 2015 so we, we had to lay off 22 people and and you know a day and we had uh been working with an outside company as consultants and they hired a new ceo on a monday and on a tuesday he said no outside consultants um and we had to fire 22 people and i just remember like that part of it and i'm like like i can't live in that state ever yeah. right there's nothing i can do do about that so if it's out of my control then then i i, I can't fear it because it's out of my control so i need to control what i can control so right yeah yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for us, you know, we hit the road 2020, a bit of an experiment year, 2021 rolls around, you know, getting kind of our teeth kicked in with a heavy value add apartment complex, eviction moratorium, you know, delinquency and uh, the RV parks are doing great. I'm enjoying them. And I'm like, man, this is dumb. Why are we, uh, why are we beating our heads against the, the wall trying to buy like a four cap apartment complex when, I can buy these parks at ridiculous prices that cash flow right away. So we just made a pretty hard pivot and said, let's change all of our focus and attention, keep the same systems, you know, the self-management, the syndication process, and just move it over to the RV park space. And that's what we did. So yeah, uh, I guess the rest is history from there. It's like uh, Dar- Dar- Darwin's theory, right? Adapt or die. Um, that's right. I think for investments, if you want to make you know low returns, you don't adapt. Right. No. You just keep doing the same thing forever. Um, and that that's that, that, that doesn't really work. Now, right. it's interesting. I find in farmland, like when I go out and I and I'm looking at investing, I'm it, it, there's a kind of a grassroots process to buying. Right. Even if even if it's a listed property, even with a realtor, it's still kind of a grassroots or effort to, to buy. And if they don't like you, they don't want to sell to you um, very, very often. Is RV kind of similar? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and I grew up, you know, as a, as a farm kid and a farmer too. So there's, that's obviously completely different businesses, but there's some similarities in, in the owner, you know, there's, there's the land the connection of that property and what they've built. Well, there's a pride. Yeah. There's a lot of pride and uh, you know, and generally very, very down earth, hardworking people. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's important to be very likable, very honest, very upfront and build those relationships is the best parks I've bought have been, you know, just knocking on the door or staying at the park and, you know, meeting, meeting the couple that's running it and getting them to like us. As there's lots of times at the RV park, there's, there's onsite, man, like live in management that live, live, live in it kind of like self-storage and actually farms too. Yeah. Um, in that, that is, so that's, that's the opportunity. It's also one of the hurdles. That's why a lot of other, 
you know, just like you, there's not very many people who are going to go put the work and effort into buying and managing farms. The same happens with RV parks because the management is not simple or easy. Um, so yeah, very common, a park that we would buy would be typically owner operated and run. And a lot of times they have a house actually on the property. They live there. So when they leave, that creates a pretty big vacuum of, of talent and knowledge to that park. And that's why, uh, that's why it's difficult to just buy a park as compared to, let's say an apartment complex, right. Where you can buy it and then hire some third party service that comes in right away. So, so you got to know what you're doing. You got to have your own team and management in there and then, Typically, we do uh, the general manager that runs that park. Typically, we offer you know that that homestead house as part of their compensation and get them to stay there, which is really good for operations and and uh, helps keep track of everything. So, do you guys have like a like a central like so for us in Weezer, where where one of our first farms is? You know, anybody yeah. going to go run a farm for us anywhere in the country will go and do like there'll be training and development that goes on out there and I make that sound kind of corporate -y, but like yeah. literally, you know, you know, yeah. you know the true breath of someone when you have to go do irrigation with them. Um sure. and and you know you're 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 in mud and 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 you you yeah. right like you know who you know the DNA of a person, right? Or when yep. there's a bear or a wolf on a property, like you know like like how the person responds or reacts. Do they really care about animals? Do they not care, right? Sure. Um, is that kind of similar like with RVs? Are you how how are you guys training your managers or are you finding people yeah. from other parts? Yeah, so so it's two parts there, right? First is the hiring process, and we learned this on the apartment side. Is we sounds this sounds bad, but we kind of we we care very little about a resume, um, particularly from the work experience side. Meaning, you know, we're hiring a property manager. I don't really care if they got thirty years of property management experience. Sometimes that to me is a negative. If you're doing the same thing you were doing thirty years ago in the same place, you're you're not you don't have the culture that, that fits what we do. So we're really, really looking for some, some key ca character uh, traits of people and that's ownership or pride of ownership, taking control of things, even if it's not theirs, you know, in the, in the work ethic component of that. And so we are really screening and writing our ads and looking for that person that wants to be, you know, we want the person in the park that eventually wants to own their own park, right? So we know we might only have them three to five years and we want to build them up and teach them everything so they can go buy their own park on their own, right? That That is perfectly acceptable to us. In those, those years that we have them though, they do an exceptional job because they have that ownership mindset. So that's that's kind of the hiring or screening process that we're looking for. And then when it comes to a new new property, we kind of, so we're all military guys. So we, we essentially have, you know, like the, we call the the hard hit team. We buy a new property and we'll take some of the, a bunch of the existing managers and they'll go to that property, spend a few days, get all the systems up and running, teach this staff, teach the new hire, et cetera. And, uh, and then we'll also move them to the, that new hire to some of the other parks that are doing well. So it's, it's in the beginning, it's a lot of manpower going into them and then moving them around. Hey, I have an appointment. What time? Uh, it's supposed to be at 915. Uh Hey Vince, you're mute. You're not muted. Hi Vince, are you there? Sorry, Robert. Sorry, social media director somehow jumped on and, and okay. he's uh, clearly unmuted. So perfect. Okay. And no so problem. when you have the hard hit, we'll, we'll edit that out. But the when we have the yeah. hard hard hit hard hit hard hit team, right? How long have those guys been with you? A long time then. They yeah. probably did a part with you too. Yeah, typically, you know, and we're still a relatively new company. So a long time for us is, you know, two or three years. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there, there are people who have worked for us at least, at least a couple of years that, you know, are very familiar with our systems and uh, can come in and get things in place. Yeah, we um, do a lot in two or three years though, right? I mean, you look at, you know, I just look at where you were or where we were, you know, a couple of years ago and, and, you know, our, our games have changed, our companies have changed, right? Our methodologies changed and, and, you know, we've made a difference for investors, right? Um, in two or three years. So I think a lot happens, I think sometimes in a very short period of time when you're like on, 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 on that pace and stuff for, for us, I look at like kind of this, this journey of, of where you guys are. And I can see, you know, a lot, a lot of the similar traits for, for, for growth. What do you want to see? Like with RVs, do you want to own, you know, you know, a million units. Do you want to own, you know, a thousand acres, 10,000 acres? Uh, you want to be in 
these dates? Do you even care? And you're just going to ride the animal and keep raising money and just find the next good park or tell me about it. Yeah. I'm the type of guy that I, I want it all. Um, you know, so I would, I'd be happy owning every RV park in America. Um, not practical, but no, you know, our, our kind of big BHAG, big hairy audacious goal, right. Is to, is to, to be or beat KOA as a brand. So we'll, we'll be launching our own brand this summer from a customer's perspective. Um, that brand will go in the parks. And so eventually, uh, I don't know if that's going to evolve into franchising that out or not, or if it becomes all only parks that we own, et cetera. Still playing with that a little bit, but yeah, the idea is to be the kind of the next, the next real big brand in the campground space. And there's really only two right now, you know, is KOA and, and uh, Jellystone. Margaritaville is building some resorts and stuff, but those are very specific type of parks. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to really like to be that next huge brand. And that probably means, uh, you know, close to a billion dollars in parks, at least is, is the, is the number metric that I'm like trying to hit. So uh, I'd like to get that done in less than 10 years and, and run with it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. You almost feel guilty, right. S stating those kind of goals, right. Right. Yeah. Publicly since like, like, but I'm, I'm the exact same way. Right. I'd like to be one of the largest farm producers and farm owners and in, in all of America. Right. Um, yeah. if, 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 if in reality, I'd like to be the largest farm owner in, in America, right. Yeah. Um, with our, with our, you know, partners and investors and our, our, our collective collective group. But I, I also think that's a decision you have to make, right. Because if you're going to, stay small and, and and it's about personal gain right in a lot of ways the immediate personal gain is going to be you know less for a number of years when you're going through you know the growth the growth cycle and stuff um you know i remember you know i look at employees that have been with me you know a decade plus and a yeah. decade ago there was a time where six seven years later we were three three x the size of the company but i really wasn't making more money now i've kind of hit the other side of the curve now where you know, my money, you know, that's coming in is, is, is on a different level, but I think there, there's, there's going to, you're going to have to have patience. And even, even at what we do now, if I decided, Hey, let's just concentrate on pure profit. Right. Then I would let go of the, the B number. I would let go of being, you know, some of the largest, you know, collective farm owner, right. Cause, cause it's not really about you or me owning the most RV parks, or it's not really about us as individuals. It's our investors, our co-owners are fractionalized, right? Ownership and stuff with, with other people. But there is something that's fun about building and about Absolutely. like the machine being built built and stuff. And I, I think that's a lot of fun. I, I also think that, that there's got to be some farms that need RV parks, bro. Come on, wow. we got to get we got to get deep in this conversation. And you're in Wyoming. I mean, it's not that far yeah. to Idaho from Wyoming. You got to go, go visit, go visit Weezer. I know. Oh, my, my wife says all, all she really wants is a horse farm on the beach with an RV park and I want the airport. So I'm just looking for a very simple property that, you know, has the airport RV park and horse farm on the beach. We're good to go then. I mean, I always think, you know, why are, why are, you know, successful people created well, when they have spouses like that, you know, I have a similar <laughs> yeah. has, has great goals too. So that, that's pretty funny. I had a memory when I was like in my twenties, I went to Fiji and we were literally driving down like this old broken, like highway in Fiji. Yeah. And there's these horses, they would have tied literally to trees. And, yeah. and like, you're, you're going, through, and it's like, man, I got horses tied to trees. And then there's these little boys. Right. And like, like we kind of pause and sure. they're like, come ride our horses. Right. And so we ended up like literally riding bareback. My, <laughs> I grew up riding. So I, I and, yeah. but we, we rode bareback on a beach in Fiji um, with these horses. And when we walk into like this house, right. And like, you know, there's these little boys who are, you know, making money from, from us tourists and there's no adults around. Right. And they have all these pictures on the walls of all these like national rugby teams. And like, you know, it'd be like USA, yeah. you know, baseball or USA soccer, right. To us. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it was just, it was just kind of a, a, a fun experience. So I can see your wife wanting to ride a horse on the beach would be, be pretty cool. She's out there right now playing cowboy, like helping one of the ranchers wrangle up a couple hundred head of cattle and they're sorting and separating right now. So um, I'm watching the kids through the window and they're out there playing cowboy. So she loves the horses. I, I could kind of care less. I'm a boat guy. I like the boats, but um, you know, keep her happy. I'm happy. 
it's funny. We did one of our inner circle retreats out at our Idaho farm. And everybody's like, they, we did this experience for their investors, like where they were riding horses and are taking them yeah. on a tour. So he's like, why aren't you getting on a horse? I said, I, I am very clear on riding horses. I know how to ride horses. I have no desire to go spend five miles riding a horse and the way, way my ass is going to feel the next yep. day. Um, there's no desire. I actually had to make a rule on our, our Weezer farm that uh, nobody under the age of 18 can be on a horse without a helmet because because like 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 the safety side of it, like when you run a corporation, oh, yeah. and there's kind of that, that other side. Of it. But we had a couple hundred head. Uh, we had, I think, um, 200 pairs this year. Um, nice. So, okay. so we're start, our cattle starting to grow. We're, we're in negotiations on a butcher shop right now. As, okay. uh, as well so it's, it's pretty pretty freaking cool so I yeah your you. wife your wife uh, definitely got to see she can go there we can we can have a branding um session yeah. she can she can handle the newborns and stuff and you know we all, all do this work together she would love it for sure yeah price of beef is good now too for you it's a good year really good yeah. yeah the beef is really good because it's our beef right and so we we treat it and take care of it you know the right way and so so yeah that's really good um, one of the things I'd say is, you know, our original farm acquisition leader, farm owner, right, is I kind of felt the same way, like he was going to own his own farms. You know, that's just, you know, he's that good. He's that great. And I say, I think for me, talent, keeping talent is very hard, right, with extraordinarily talented people. So we actually, um, when we opened our Rad America, our farmland, we, we made him uh, an equity partner right nice. with us and stuff and i don't know you know what that model looks like in rv parks but like you know fractionalized ownership is what we already do with all of our investors and so, so with some right. of my you know individual farm leaders we've done that done that for them and, and i think for them it's not even about money sometimes it's it's about them owning what they're putting their hands into every single day i think has made it made a real difference difference for that but i mean he's a freaking I mean, you know, your workhorses, your 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 geniuses, right? I mean, he he literally looks at a farm in Tennessee and a farm in Arkansas and a farm in Idaho, and like, and 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 when he's in person, he looks at it and it's like a piece, of, it's like Da Vinci, right, <laughs> to him, and like he's like the whole composing and the artwork of the farm and the things come 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 together and stuff. Tell me on RVs, right? What what are you looking for? How what size? How many? How many? You know, what kind of location? You know, yeah. I know you probably run your own math on each individual. Like that's how I evaluate a property is I don't let somebody else's. P I mean, I like to know what their PLs and balance sheets are, but I always am just going to run my own math. Like when I run this, what am I? How much? How are we going to produce income and make money? But what are you looking for? Yeah, so a lot of it's going to be geography based, you know, right? Because at the end of the day, it's a hospitality business. It's got to be somewhere people want to go. You know, and so that doesn't necessarily mean cities. That doesn't necessarily mean your your typical places. So you, when I roll up to a park and I see it, it's like, well, this thing is beautiful or it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to quantify, but um, geography wise, right? Our model really it's real though. is real, right? Yeah. Uh, our geography wise, right? I think about this. If you could draw an imaginary line, like freezing, freezing line in South, you know, so that's kind of like Nashville, Richmond, Virginia, kind of run that across there. Like that south is where we want to be. And then if you drew a line down the bottom where it gets too hot to be out inside in the summer, you know, kind of Orlando and south and south Texas, that north, right? So I love that belt um, because it's basically got weather, whether it's really desirable or not, but it's weather that you can live and play in all year round. All right. And so that one of our criteria is that it is a park that's open all year. I love Wyoming. I love the West, you know, but we just would not invest out there right now simply because the park is shut down for four to six months out of the year. Right. And that, that makes things a lot more risky to our investors from a, you know, a bad year type perspective. And it's just a lot more hassle to keep that talent um, from the management side too. So, so for us, that's one of the, one of the top criteria is that, that it is or has the ability to be open all year round love to be off the interstate exits particularly I think the when you i think when you hit a certain size right your internal ecosystem because you'll run a retail business along with the investing and the capital raising part of your business right i think right. like when you hit a certain size in your internal ecosystem will make more sense right with with a broader range but right, right. now it doesn't it doesn't make it doesn't make sense with re, like like the more you can concentrate your geography right. I think makes 
I think what you're saying makes make, makes makes a lot of sense. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, and then you know, uh, obviously being close to an interstate exit is is nice. You know, uh, particular corridors like I-10, I-20, and then the north-south corridors of uh, 65 and 75, and then 95 over on the on the east coast. You know, where you have a lot of Canadians going to Florida or vice versa, north-south, and your east-west corridors. You know, those. Those are uh, places that we target, um, close to interstate exits, right? Uh, water features, love to have some type of water feature at, a, at an RV park. Um, you know, some, sometimes that's as simple as a really cool pool, but, you know, ideally there's a stream or river or pond or lake or something. Yeah, we had a, we had a farm in uh, Georgia we were negotiating on and it had uh, a 300 acre lake because um, it was an old uh, uh, quarry, you know, where yeah. they were, it wasn't, it wasn't quarry. They were pulling, um, I want to say it's lime, right? Out of the, out of the ground. Right. Yeah. And so they had created this massive lake and we're like, we, but we couldn't get the numbers to, to, to equate it on it. I was like, man, that would have been like badass water, water, water yeah. feature as well. A lot of our farms are rivers that, that we yeah. do, that we do, you know, it's, it's very common. Like I always like having the water running the, oh, like yeah. the act water source on property. It makes just such a huge difference to the beauty of the property. And, and also for us, a resource that we can't, you know, water's, water's what it is. Like it's only the it resource is. that, that all of our bodies. Yeah. I mean, you, you obviously need it for a practical purpose, but humans are drawn to water, particularly moving water, right? That's, that's what sustains life, water, fire. You know, there's a reason we can all sit around a campfire and watch, watch that fire and do nothing or sit beside the beach, you know? So uh, that those, I can, I can create fire pits, but it's pretty hard for me to create flowing water at a park. So yeah. I can find a, find a property there that has that. That's something we're, we're going to be pretty serious about. So where, where, where do you live that, that you're boating? I live in Pensacola, Florida. So you're yeah. in Pensacola. Also, you're right around the corner for me. All right. So you're yeah. going to take me out on a boat. You got to take me out on your boat then. Heck yeah. We go fishing. So yeah, live on the Gulf coast, you know, the saltwater fishing life, deep sea fishing, you know, put the boat in, run up the river and do wake, wakeboarding and wake surfing and all that stuff. So that's, that's my hobby. They can, they can keep the horses. I, I got hooked on the deep sea fishing. Like my first, I came out of Iowa, right. And I was going from playing baseball at Iowa to coaching at university of San Francisco. And yeah. uh, my girlfriend's dad at that time was like, Hey, let's go out deep sea fishing so we went out salmon was the season we went out and caught like four salmon and like like they're just they were these huge fish and like i caught bass right in iowa and catfish yeah. um and Craig caught giant catfish and so like and then we like we're carrying 90 pounds of you know filleted salmon um into a freezer and i'm like in an apartment and like this freezer's like literally stuffed like to the brim yeah. with salmon i don't know if i'd ever eaten salmon that i could recall or remember at that yeah. point in my life, the next year of my life, there was a lot of different ways of how to eat, how to eat salmon. Because you know, you're you know, coaching baseball, you're poor, you know, same as a poor college kid, right? So yeah. having 90 pounds of meat in the freezer was pretty, pretty freaking nice. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. I'm sure, it was delicious. And then too. I went out, uh, I went out to the Outer Banks with with some partners, and I want to say I can't remember how many uh, yellowtail we caught, but it was literally. I remember we had them all laid out, and it was literally. You know, it was, whether it was 14, 15, 16, yeah. yellowtail. And we've been out for like three, four hours and not caught a single thing. And then I think we caught like all like 15 to 20 of them, like in like 30 minutes. And it's it was all... just like, bzz, really, and like probably one of the most intense workouts I'd had. Like my shoulder literally felt like it was going to fall off afterwards. Yeah, and so what do you, what do you like to fish for the most? That's the thing, you know, it's snapper season right now, which I'm missing back home, which is phenomenal and delicious. So I can tell you're a little bothered by that. Yeah, I am right. All my buddies are, it was opening, I think today. Yeah. Today or tomorrow is uh, going to be opening season. And it's, it's very narrow season down there. It's like a couple weeks at the most and you go out there. So uh always love fishing for those. Um They're just delicious. And then, you know, tuna, we got the rigs and stuff is pretty, pretty awesome. Kept, kept some yellowtail and blacktail tuna, love sushi. Um, So that's, it's, it's fun. It's part of great, great, great joy of life right there. All right. Now my ADD moment's over. Um, okay. Back to the RV park, right? So yeah. talk to me about math. what does a math look like on these things? Because I've never evaluated one. I've never looked at, looked deeply at an RV park, right? Um, I've done a lot of real estate, but I've never, I never dove, dove all the way into one of those. So tell me what the math is. Talk me yeah. through it. 
pretty wide breadth. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we still break, break it down, break it down to a cap rate and break it down to an IRR in, uh, Typically, you know, we're buying parks right now from eight to 10 caps. Um, usually we can get them around 12 to 15 after we've put some work into them and, and got them up and up and running. Um, we, you know, that price per pad, I guess, would be the other metric that we're looking at. Again, it ranges pretty significantly. You know, you can go from from twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a site up to a hundred thousand, you know, maybe maybe in a little bit above that, you're super high and stuff. But typically, we're probably forty five to sixty five thousand a site is kind of the sweet spot that we're paying right now. Um, and you know, operation wise, we're we're right around fifty percent is our opex, you know, our expense ratio to our revenue generally. Um, so those are the, those are the kind of rules of thumbs, I would say that put us, put us in there. Um, but a lot of times, again, you're, we're going into a park that has been owner operated for 20 or 30 years, maybe and built by the same people, great people, uh, but just have never pushed anything never expanded anything, never brought any systems in, you know? And so the, the beauty of RV parks that I love is it's kind of that rule of small numbers come in, let's say the nightly rate is $37 a night. Right. And, uh, we put in the booking system, we put in the dynamic price and, and literally overnight, right. The rate becomes $45 a night. Well, that's what eight bucks. Um, that is, that's nothing to the customer, maybe an extra 50 bucks on their stay, but that's, you know, it's 20% revenue increase for the year. And no one, the, no one really cares, right. It doesn't hurt anyone to, to some extent. So, you can come in and really change small numbers, but have a big magnitude for the year. Same thing on a, on well, a, it's a multiplier effect, right? You increase, yeah. you, know, you, you increase income by $10,000 and you've increased value of, you know, asset by a hundred thousand, you know, Correct. and, and, and it increased, you know, if you're just looking at 10 caps for those people doing the math. Right. Um, yeah. And so if you're talking, you know, you're starting at an eight cap and you're moving to a 15 cap, you know, it's 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 a huge difference and so that seven percent is is massive right when you look at a multiplier and how, how quickly what what kind of size do you have to be like what's kind of is it a million revenue a year a couple hundred thousand revenue a year what kind of size kind of minimum yeah so, sites wise we want at least 100 sites typically and really the bottom revenue is about five hundred thousand for us to be able to make it work um that's that's really pushing it you know if you don't have a, at least a half million in revenue it's going to be pretty difficult to operate um, so ideally it's close to a million in revenue on up per, per park would be the, the ideal park to buy for us. So if you're a million in revenue, 500 K in income on a 10 cap, so like 5 million, or, you know, if you're seven or eight caps, so you're like at six, 7 million kind of average purchase then. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, you know, it seems like most parks fall between three to 6 million or 20 million on up there's 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 not a lot of in between parks uh so we buy a lot of a lot of parks in the five million range is a very very common average um you know and it's surprising like we still find some deals we just closed on a park in arizona i mean a bit embarrassed right uh that thing gross revenue is about 1.1 million we paid uh 2.8 million for the park so uh, that was that was going to be a home run for us. It's owner financed. It's that's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, the the those finding those kind of deals is amazing, right? And yeah. I think the average you know American doesn't even can't even comprehend right owning an asset where you know somebody else is doing this financing and your ability to get in is is so incredible. But for your investors, you know that that return long term is going to be incredible. I know you can't speak to some some future returns because because we're all sure. right you have public security i have a public security we have to be very careful about what we say right so let's do those quick podcast right. disclosures right um we're doing a podcast <laughs> here we're not offering we're not offering securities um neither one of us are lawyers we're not financial advisors right um we're not giving tax advice on this sucker right if you invest with climb capital um to be clear climb capital is giving me nothing for them being on our podcast, it's not a sponsored thing, right? Him, you know, we met and and we started discussing business, you know, and I found that RV parks is something I wanted to educate our investors on. I wanted to give them access to. And so like, like, so Robert and I don't have some financial arrangement, right? It's, 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 there's a mutual exchange of, of thought leadership 
um, when it comes to uh, investing, when it comes to RV parks and stuff. And, and obviously there's no promised future when it comes to returns with investing and everything has risk. And if you did go and invest in climb capital, read their offering circular, do your due diligence, take your time, make a good decision, right? For, for yourself um, and your family, you know, and then, you know, if, it, if it's rad and one of rad's vehicles, right? Um, do your same due diligence, do those kind of things. This, this happens to be out there on, on the public. I just want to make sure we're, you know, following, you know, my compliance office doesn't want to kick my butt um, for, for any, for any <laughs> of the clients. Yeah. So yeah, I, I love this park thing, man. Like, um, you know, us personally, you know, I, I would definitely consider making an investment, right? With climb, you know, I yeah. love real estate. Um, I'm never going to be a good as good at, as uh, RV parks are you, right? Um, it's amazing with farmland. How often do you ever feel this way? And this is a little behind the scenes for people, right? When you've talked with like high net worth investors, or you've talked with institutions or different things, right? And because I know you've, you you're out there raising capital to go make your business grow and succeed, right? How often are yep. you ever feeling like? someone's asking you questions because they like feel like they could go do like this themselves themselves and stuff. Cause I get that with farming all the, all the time. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, you always have that self doubt, like that kind of scarcity mindset of, oh, I don't want to create another competitor. Why am I telling everyone about this great idea? You know, I battled with that for a long time, still, still, still sits in the back of my head, you know, like, why am I doing this podcast? And all these other people are going to go start buying them, you know, but, uh, I, I found that there are very, very few people that are willing to take, that are willing to do the work that's needed, right? Um, raising capital is actually kind of easy. Um, and I think most people know that now. And I think that will be a major downfall of the multifamily side of it is raising capital was, was pretty easy. All you had to do is be, you know, be good at marketing and raise capital and buy something and turn it over. There wasn't a whole lot of thought. But with what you do and what we do, you know, that it, there's no, there's no template. There's no easy button. There's no um, shortcuts, I guess, is the best way to put it. So, uh, so I don't, I don't have that concern anymore. I think the benefit of educating people and what we do and the opportunity there is to bring in more people on the investment side. And there is a need just to sophisticate the entire asset class. And that, that, does yield me personal benefit down the road, right? Because, you know, if the market, let's, let's say the, the asset market cap rate right now is averages is 10 and the multifamily is at five and a half. Well, that spread will always decrease as people chase yield. And so, you know, my 11 parks are soon to be 13 parks, right? That I'm buying now, you know, just by the nature of more people investing in that will increase our investors return as those cap rates decompress. Right. So, so the, uh, even with the farmland, right. Uh, you know, farmland RV parks, they're hard, they're difficult, but people will come into the space because they are opportunities. And so we've got a, we've got a run of maybe 10, 15 years of being ahead of the curve, in my opinion. Um, and then it'll probably normalize to some extent, just like many stores did, just like multifamily has done for the last 70 years. So, so there's a, I think there's a mutual benefit there of creating some competition, great, bringing more people in, bringing more investors in, bringing more capital in. That's great for the industry. At the end of the day, uh, you know, firm believer of the rising tide lifts all yachts or, you know, the, the pie is as big as you want to make it. So I, I don't think there's any, it goes back to the encouraging our employees to become their own owners, right? So I want our vision to be so big that their vision is too big to accomplish on their own and that they need our, they need and want our help. And we will continue to invest with them as a, maybe as an LP. So I, I just, the more you can help people, I think the, the more you will get back and that's not why you do it, but it is, it is a result of just helping and educating. Yeah. I, you know, so in, in, in the book, Money Shackles, right, is, is you know, we just completed it and we uh, started teaching at our, at our recent, recent conference. And so one of the concepts I teach uh, our people is the difference between a true operator and a babysitter. Um, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, Robert's obviously, you know, a true operator when it comes to his business. That's, you know, high, high appraise, you know, that I can give someone right when, when I Thank think you. You know about an operator. And I look at, you know, some of those things that the abundance mindset when it comes to money is kind of like a relatively new 
concept in the greater world of finance and money. Like first there was, you know, if you looked at it, like hippies and like, you know, 60s and 70s, there started to be some abundance mindset in different ways, right? And yeah. then you started to look at, you know, there being different places with abundance, right? And abundance isn't welfare. They're very different things, right? Abundance is about people pursuing and chasing and believing and building their own dream and about people, yeah. you know, being being capitalistic and, 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 and winning, right? And in 2012 with the Jobs Act, you know, which, you know, I, I run a reggae, right? Um, you run a reggae as well, right? Correct? No, these are reg D's. These are reg D's. So, so you run a, a public, secu- you know, a public public offering, right? Um, for or a security, right? Not a public offering, a security, right? Yeah. Um, but either way, that's why I'm not a lawyer, everybody. So the the the, the kind of the cool part with with this is is like that when that Jobs Act passed, it opened up some new vehicles, some new ways, right? And crowdfunding opened up, and 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 some unique unique ways as well, and so. I think that's you know pretty fascinating with with your model and, and your business and stuff it just makes it a lot of opportunity available right for for people to yeah. be a fractalized owner like an average person does not think you know how, how am i going to get to arizona to find the owner who's yeah. going to sell their finance to me and something that's a 20 cap right and like yeah. like that's that's completely beyond mind-blowing in 2010 i was teaching a course called commercial short sales unleashed right and i remember like we had thousands of students sending us deals and we had this this huge pipeline but for me to find the needle in the haystack you know the seller finance 20 cap right but those deals do exist and do. and so so it, it's a lot of fun so for you to be able to share an ownership with that because when yeah. i in 2010 i couldn't do that nobody could share in the ownership of those properties and assets with me and then the compounding effect of shared ownership is is an accelerator um for the growth of your business well i'm going to tell you this man robert you got to do a reggae um, we got okay. to get you, gotta, you know, I'll give you every help I can with it. Right. Cause yeah. you have a model that belongs right. Um, yeah. in, in that industry. And, and, and I know that, you know, we have a lot of non-accredited people that will listen, you know, to this, this podcast that would, you know, if you run a reggae, they could invest with you. Right. Um, and then definitely, yeah. Cause, cause your model is badass. I, I, I love it. Right. I'll never do it because I don't, you know, I'm not an RB park guy. Um, yeah. and I got, um, a very long ways to go in and farmland before before I feel like you know the the babysitters you know uh, marginalize my cap rates and stuff. So um, yep, they they they're gonna, they they will come and try. But I will. Here's what I will also say: when That's they come in, apartments are easy. It's pretty hard to screw up an apartment if you get it at a good price. Like, yep. but I think you know, RV parks, farmland, it, it's a different beast. It's like. You know, it's one thing to go ride the the horse that um you know is used to being a a, a, a trail horse um yeah. you know for, for horseback riding led by guides and there's another thing to get the wild stallion and say you know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tame 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 this sucker and good yeah. luck being a sitter and trying to tame the wild beast so yeah. um you know what else would you want to share with people about RV parks and stuff I mean. I I think it's 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 one of the coolest models that I've I've I haven't been fascinated by a real estate model in a long time. So besides yeah. besides besides my you own know, farm. So so and I appreciate it. It's, that's that's a lot of great compliments in there, and that does mean a lot coming from you. Um, and I love the term. I never thought of it as babysitters. So that's that's a good term. I'm gonna probably steal that and think about it. Operators versus babysitters. I like that. Um, so I mean, going back to the RV space, you know, it's like a so I think the mis- misconception could be that it is a luxury item, right? Sorry, getting attacked here. So I think the misconception is that, you know, it can be, it can be a luxury item, um, you know, like a sports car, right? Well, why would people go vacationing? You know, if times get tough, what's going to happen to these parks? And uh, last month or even, no, last week, the uh, uh, data came out for RV sales and they dropped it was 43%, I think, year over year from last quarter, you know, so, hey, is that concerning to us, right? So there's a lot of kind of talk of that. So the two two answers. One, before we went into this, we went and looked at 2000.com. We looked at 2008. We looked at the early 80s stuff and all the same model. Sales dropped in 2008, 60% drop in sales of the, of the RV parks, or sorry, of the RVs themselves. But the parks, state parks, 
and private parks, their occupancy stay the same, rates essentially stay the same. So little to no impact on all three of those recessions. And so that's one of the main reasons, you know, we just said, okay, here's something we can dig our teeth into no matter what's going to happen. Um, and so, so, and if I let me put this the best way I can, is that my worst case scenario is that I can turn this RV park, campground, vacation, destination, resort, whatever you want to call it, I can turn it into workforce, workforce housing like overnight, right? And basically just say, hey, you got, a, you got a camper, you need a place to live, come here, park it, pay me by the month, pay me by the week, whatever, right? And not to, I don't want to stereotype, stereotype any type of things, but you can turn it into a, to a really low end trailer park very quickly. And I say that because that is my, that's my, my worst case scenario. And in that scenario, yeah, yeah, I'm still making great revenue, just like a mobile home park would, right? So, so I feel like you know I've found an asset class that takes the best of all the all the different multifamily aspects. You know, I I can remove people quickly because they're guests, not tenants, um, but I am providing a form of housing which is a necessity of life which has always been kind of one of my fundamentals you know you're you're providing food that's a necessity of life right um food clothing housing water necessity of life you can never go wrong owning those those type of assets and so um that's the negative like the less glamorous not the campfire and the kayaking side of it but at the end of the day like that, i know a lot of i don't know i know a lot of wealthy mobile homeowners so yeah it's, 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 it, there's a model there too, right? That, yeah, that and is, I did very well. I still own a bunch of mobile homes. I, I mean, I love them, you know, but it's a, uh, I can take that campground resort, so to speak, and turn it into a mobile home park overnight just by changing my rules and regulations. Well, cool. So um, we're wrapped, right? Um, sure. I appreciate it, man. It, it was a kick ass podcast. You, like, my team is going to cut up some really amazing, like, intellectual clips there, too. Um, <laughs> maybe they won't talk about me, um, you know, and, and my experience of my child almost dying, you know, and yeah, Zion, yeah. but maybe it'll be good too for the podcast. But yeah, they'll cut up some really cool clips and um, go, go have fun with your family. Appreciate you taking the time on a vacation to do this, awesome. man. Cause, by the way, I, you know, it's. Well, whack it i don't know if the lighting shifted or changed it but i just saw the buck in the background for the first time <laughs> um and I, I didn't notice it before so it's probably it was there the whole time but yeah, yeah have fun um you know if you uh you know where are you living now i'm in tampa i'm in tampa so okay i'm for some reason i was pretty, thinking san diego not, not too- I, don't know why I got san diego you know, I was in uh, California for a long time, and then I, you know, I'm a, I call it a COVID red refugee, where I, I, you know, between all of the different changes, and you know, um, you know, I recently got hit with, you know, the pain of of selling rug- luxury real estate in California with with high. I'm talking about, you know, assets um, where we're gonna have to pay, you know, an extra five percent or ten percent on some assets that we sell there in california but i'm so glad i don't pay the 11 percent state tax anymore so pretty pretty happy yeah. with florida i don't know if i could be any happier so i moved here a year and a half ago awesome. and i don't know if i could love it anymore so my partner amy always lived here so our office our more of our employees were always here um and yeah. here, here in florida um so actually even to be able to walk in the office and work with her every day too is pretty special we've been in business since 2009 together partner since 2011 so it's pretty cool Awesome. Yeah. No, thank you so much for having, uh, having me on here. Really, really I mean, fun. I would love to, you know, down the road, it, I would love to do more education, right. For people yeah. um, on RVs. And if we can set up a platform where if we give that education and then they could have a path, you know, um, I want to be one of the great is real estate educators in, in the history of our country. Um, and, and so if we set up a path where you do some, you know, RV education and, and at the end of it, you know, if people want to invest with you, that's great. I've always found doing education, um, brings investors, you know, and I've always found that to be pretty, pretty good for me. So, um, but, uh, if you're open to that, you know, maybe that's something we'll do, you know, in the future too. So. Yeah. Love to continue to talk about it. Learn, learn the reggae stuff a little bit. Uh, education stuff, you know, I got and the some first thing with the reggae is you got to get audited financials, right? Um, makes makes a difference, and that can be hard, you know, um, if you're not used to that. Um, and then the second thing I'd say is, you know, you got to have the right lawyers, and I can refer you to the right lawyers, um, and and that and that okay. kind of thing. 
Um, I'd love to say I could refer you to the right auditors, but our guy got cancer. Um, and, and so he stepped away from auditing in like February. And so like we had to re-hit the, the start button on finding, finding good auditors. So, um, that's but uh, outside of that, you know, I'll get you with the right lawyers. Cause that's, that's, that was my first journey. It took me two years because the first set of lawyers took me six months to find a really good, the first set of lawyers. And then the first yeah. set of lawyers you know, acted like they had done it and never really done it. And so, but now I feel like I'm with the best, you know, we use two different law firms for stuff. And I think they're both the best two firms in the reggae industry period. They have the most offerings that go through the sec and everything. So nice. I can connect you with them for sure. So. Awesome. Appreciate your time. All right, brother. We'll talk. Enjoy your vacation. See ya. See ya.